Amen. We give our children's worker a big hand. Our children's workers, they did so great this week. Praise the Lord. Hello, friends. How are you today? You good? All right, I want you to take your Bibles. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 4. And if you need a Bible, raise your hand like this. Just keep it lifted, and one will materialize in front of you. If you don't know me, I'm Scott, one of the pastors here at Shelter Cove. We are continuing on in a series entitled Authentic Church. Authentic Church. And we're looking at the, the early believers in the book of Acts as a blueprint, as kind of a guidelines for how to proceed, how to do and to be everything that God wants us to do and to be as his church. You know, the church is not a building, is it? The church is not an organization. The church is people. It's the people who have put their faith in who? In Jesus Christ. And it's his presence in our life. It's his purpose on our life that defines us as this thing called the church. And we learn how to be that by the example of the first believers. Would you stand with me if you've turned to Acts 4? And we're going to pick it up in the middle of the chapter. We're not actually going to read the entire text today. There's a lot of text, and we're going to go through it verse by verse. But what we are going to do is we're going to pray. Let's go to the Lord and ask his blessing upon our time in the word today. Heavenly Father, we gather, and we do not take for granted the freedom and the privilege of coming together, Lord, because around the world we know we have brothers and sisters in Christ who are, are facing persecution, God, just like the early church faced. And so, God, as we come together, we see this as a solemn privilege, as an honor, as we worship together and we sing together and we open the word together and we pray together. And may our prayer mirror and echo the sentiment, the heart, the mindset, the passion of this early church as we read about them today and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to jump in, but we want a little bit of background. We need to start with the context where we pick it up in verse 23 of Acts chapter 4. Over the last couple weeks, we've looked at some exciting incidents that have happened in the life of the early church. And we're looking at the primary players of the apostles, Peter and John. And a couple weeks ago in Acts 3, we saw that Peter and John are on their way to the temple where they're going to worship. And while going there, they pass a landmark called the Beautiful Gate. And seated in front of the beautiful gate is a beggar. He's a lame beggar. He's been lame since birth. And it's no accident that he's seated in front of the, the most beautiful, most popular landmark on the way to the temple because he knows a lot of people are going through there. That's a high traffic area, and he stands to get the maximum amount of handouts. He knows what that guy down at Costco knows as you drive past him, right, that this is where the money is. Peter and John have probably walked by this guy a billion times. But now they are seeing him through the eyes of Jesus. And they come toward him. And Peter says, silver and gold, I do not have what I have. I give you in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. And he leaps to his feet, having never walked a day in his life. And a crowd begins to gather. And they're marveling because this is, this is lame Larry that they've walked by every day. And now he's leaping Larry. What's going on? He's dancing around. This is amazing. And an opportunity opens up for Peter and John to share the gospel. And they talk about the risen Lord Jesus. And droves and droves of people get saved and come to faith in Jesus Christ. But uh-oh, here come the Sadducees, the ruling class in Jerusalem. And they come and they shut everything down. And they drag Peter and John away. And they pull them in front of the Sanhedrin, which is the Supreme Court of Israel. And they get in their face and they say, by what power, by what name do you do the, and say these things? Peter said, I'm glad you asked. And sermon number two on the day, Peter just busts out the gospel in front of the Sanhedrin. It's a great day for Peter and John. And the Sadducees are befuddled. They are betwixt. And they look at these two guys. They don't know what to do with them. So they decide to threaten them. And they say, you will speak no more. In this name. If you do, that's it for you. And that is where we pick it up today. This early church is encountering for the very first time persecution. It would not be the last. It's going to set off a long line of, of antagonistic uh, movements against the church of Jesus Christ. Does this still happen today? Is the Christian life a bed of roses? Is it all smooth sailing? No. Nope. How many of you, when you were born again, it was the result of someone who shared Jesus Christ with you? They witnessed you. How many of you heard something like, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life? Yeah? How many of you heard, if you put your faith in him, he'll forgive your sin, and when you die, you will go to heaven to be forever with Jesus? Forever. You heard something like that? Now, that's all true, isn't it? 
That's all necessary. You need to know that to receive Jesus. But we tend to leave out something when we share the gospel. They tended to leave something out when, when I first heard the gospel. They left out that one, what is it? It's, oh, yeah, the middle. In between give your life to Jesus and go to heaven when you die, there's this thing called life, right? What happens when you go through life is you encounter hardship. You encounter difficulty and trials, and you encounter sometimes persecution, right? I wonder, does the Christian life need an honest movie trailer? Have you seen these online? It's like, it's, it's kind of a comedy bit. They show a movie trailer, but instead of the actual narration, they replace it with, this is what the movie is really about, right? And, and if there was an honest movie trailer for the Christian life, it might be something like this. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ, people will hate you. You could lose your job. Depending on what part of the world you live in, you could die. What, we omit that, right? We omit those things. Why? Because we want people to sign up. We want them in the kingdom, right? And I'm not saying that anyone regrets putting their faith in Jesus Christ. But this, the point is that this is the part of the journey that is not foreseen at the moment of conversion. All of us, at some point in our early Christian faith, we get hit. We get hit in the face. This young church just got hit. How will they respond? What is the early church's response to persecution? I'm going to give you several things today that they understood as they respond to persecution. And the first thing in your notes is they understood the greater context of their situation. This is very important that we understand the context of our situation as Christians. Peter and John have been threatened. They've been told, speak no more in this name. And they find themselves in a conflict of kingdoms. In your notes, they are in a conflict of kingdoms. You got two kingdoms, the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of of men, and they are in opposition to one another. Peter and John, when they were with Jesus last, what did he say? He said, you will be my witnesses. Now they stand in front of the leaders of Israel, and they say, you will not be his witnesses. Peter and John have two fingers pointed at them. One says, proclaim. The other says, be silent. One says, speak the truth. The other says, speak no more in this name. Who are they going to listen to? You are in a conflict of kingdoms every day, and you have to decide, who am I going to listen to? Am I going to listen to God's commands? Am I going to listen to the world's commands to be silent? So they understand their context. Secondly, they understand their purpose and place as believers. In verse 23, it says, when they, that's Peter and John, were released, they went where? To their friends. Where do you go when you encounter difficulty? Hopefully, you've got a circle of friends. I hope that you have a circle of Christian friends on whom you can lean and who can lean on you, all right? And if you don't have friends, just look around this room, make eye contact with somebody, and after the service, go up to them and set up a coffee appointment and get to know them and build some relationships, all right? We want you in community. We are working as fast as we can to start as many life groups as we can so that people can get plugged in, and the demand is great. But in the meantime, let's forge some relationships with one another and build some community because you need Christian relationships, all right? And so they go to their friends. This is that five to 10,000 uh, young believers there in Jerusalem. And it says they reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. This is like their, 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 their giant small group of five to 10,000. And they come to this little prayer gathering of all the believers, right? And they share what happened. Can you imagine how that conversation went? Peter and John, where you been? You've been gone for hours. What happened? And they start off, and they just kind of tell some stuff, and they had some good things to share, didn't they? They said, well, we, we were going to the temple, and we saw a beggar, and we, through the power of God, healed him. Praise God. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and, and then that opened up this whole opportunity to share the gospel, and, and uh, thousands of people came to Christ. No way. Hallelujah. That's, that's incredible. Yeah. And then we went in front of the Sanhedrin, and they got in our face, and we were able to share the gospel with them. Oh, praise the Lord. That's amazing. So these are the praise reports. All right? You always have praise reports at every prayer group. But then, here comes the prayer request. What happened next? Oh, you know, they, they, uh, they said uh, if we did it again, you know, they'd kill us. That's a prayer request. 
That's no ingrown toenail or, or you know, my mother-in-law's sick. That, they, they're going to kill us. Did, did they take that lightly or did they take that seriously? They took it seriously and for good reason because in the ensuing chapters of Acts, you're going to see the disciples stoned. Uh, Peter uh, is going to be persecuted. Uh, Stephen is going to be stoned to death. They're going to unleash Saul of Tarsus on the church and countless Christians are going to be dragged away. To jail. History records that all 12 disciples will die horrible, brutal deaths, with the exception of John, whom they tried to boil alive in oil, and God supernaturally preserved him so that he would write Revelation. But the other disciples, they were crucified, they were beheaded, they were they were stoned, they were run through with spears, they had their brains bashed in with clubs. This is what they're in for, and they know it because Jesus predicted it. He said, the world hates you. It hated me first. In this world, you will have trouble. He said, uh, Peter, when you are grown, other men are going to dress you, lead you somewhere you do not want to go. He prophesied Peter's execution. So they know this is coming. That doesn't mean they're happy about it. That doesn't mean that, that they're not fearful. And they hear this threat, and they remember what happened to Jesus, and they know what is coming for them, and they are stricken with fear. Do you think that that was natural? Jesus was stricken with anxiety in the garden. We see that he prayed. He said, Lord, take this cup, but not my will, yours be done. We all have anxiety. We all have fear. But in your notes, I want you to see fear can be good if it drives you to God. Fear can be good when it drives you to God. If fear gets you on your knees in a place of dependence and you're looking to the one who can meet your need, the one that you can depend upon, that's a good thing. We had something fearful happen to us in the last week. A few days ago, I was in front of my house. We uh, were planting in our front yard, and we have this concrete divider there, and it has kind of buckled over the years. A tree grew underneath it, and it's, it's all warped, so it had to go. So I have a sledgehammer, and I'm kind of chunking this thing up, right? Now, normally when manual labor is going on, my 13-year-old son Hayden is nowhere to be found. But if it involves destruction of property, he's fascinated, all right? So he shows up with a big grin. What are you doing, Dad? I said, do you want to bust up some concrete, son? He's like, yeah. So I let him break up some concrete, okay? And, and, and then I noticed we're getting quite a pile of loose concrete, okay? There's chunks like this big. I said, son, go grab the wheelbarrow for dad, okay? So he runs off. I keep at it, and I'm breaking up the concrete, and I'm taking these chunks, and I'm just kind of tossing them behind me to make room. Well, that little fella got back quicker than I expected him to. And I did not see him. I grabbed a piece of concrete about that big, and I just tossed it behind me, and I heard what no parent wants to hear. I heard the voice of my child cry out in pain. He had bent over to pick up something, and he was about that level, and I threw the concrete, and I struck my son in the head with concrete right about there. I turned to see him rolling on the ground, clutching his head. Blood is streaming from his head wound. Now, before I go any further, I want you to know he's okay. He's just fine. He's here today. You'll see him in a little bit, all right? He's fine. But in that moment, I was scared. You know how head wounds can bleed, right? I mean, they just bleed and bleed. So I scoop him up. I put pressure on his head. I bust into the house. My wife meets us at the door. Her eyes are big as saucers. And then she looks at me as if to say, what did you do? <laughs> Can't say I blame her. We, we decide very quickly we've got to go to the ER, all right, and we get in the van. She's clutching him. She's cradling him in the back. I'm turning my minivan into a drag racer. I'm booking it to Kaiser, praying the whole way, you know. And by the time we get there, the bleeding has largely stopped, thank the Lord, and he's able to walk on his own, and we get him in the ER. They usher us in, and they wrap his head and everything, and they're asking him questions. What's your name? How old are you? Where do you go to school? Who's the president? Who do you wish was the president? Just all these basic and we're starting to calm down. He's cracking smiles and all that. And they say, the lady is doing the input in the computer. And she says, so, how did this happen? And before I get a word out, my wife says, his father hit him in the head with a sledgehammer. <laughs> Wait, what? No, no. The lady at the computer goes. And I'm picturing social services going, you know. And we set the record straight, although I don't know that 
hitting him with concrete is any better than a sledgehammer. But fear got us where we needed to go. And they took care of him. And we got healing. And we prayed, all right? When you are encountering something that causes you fear, hopefully you hit your knees. Hopefully you don't just try to come up with a solution on your own. And you don't seek out the wisdom of man. And you go to the one source of all wisdom and all provision, all right? That's where the disciples went. They went to their friends. And it says that they lifted their voices together to God in verse 24. They lifted their voices together. Together. That Greek word is homothumadon, which means literally with one accord. They prayed with one accord, with one, with one voice, with one passion. There were not multiple agendas as they prayed. They were of one agenda. What was that unifying passion that they prayed with? It's the same unifying passion that we have as the people of God in any New Testament church. In your notes, it's this. To be a witness is our unified passion. That should be the thing that defines us as a New Testament church, to be a witness. You go out of this room, you look on the wall, what do you see? It's the Great Commission. Go, therefore, make disciples of all peoples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything I have taught you, and lo, I am with you till the end of the day. This is what we are here to do. The Sadducee said, speak no more in this name. The disciples said, we cannot help but speak in this name. It is what makes us who we are. This is the command of our great Lord, and they are unified in that passion. To be a witness, reaching and raising authentic followers of Jesus is our mission statement. We ever veer from that, we ever lose sight of that, I pray we shrivel up and die as a church because we'll be worthless. That is our unifying passion. So they understand their context. They understand their purpose and their place. And third, they understand who they're working with. They don't just serve a big God. They serve the biggest God imaginable. And they go to the Lord. They pray to God. And you cannot describe God in any grander terms than these believers describe him in their prayer. If I asked you to describe God in the most grandiose way that you possibly could in a couple of sentences, you would give him a title. You would say something about the fact that he created everything, that everything comes from him. You would say something about the fact that he is in total control, that he is in complete authority over everything that happens, the good, the bad, everything. And that's what they do. They pray, Sovereign Lord, verse 24. Sovereign Lord. That word for Lord is not the usual word for Lord in the Greek. Normally you see the Greek word kurios. This is not kurios. This is despotes. Despotes. We get our English word despot from that. What's a despot? It has a negative connotation, doesn't it? When I think of a despot, I think of somebody who answers to nobody, kind of an authoritarian, a, a, a dictator, you know, uh, like an evil uh, ruler, like a, like a Hitler, a uh, Mussolini, a Stalin, and, and Idi Amin, people like that. We think of that because human beings who answer to no one is not a good thing because we are fallen. But when it comes to God, he is 100% good, he is 100% pure, he is 100% wise, and he is accountable to no one. He answers to no one. He is the ultimate despot. He is their great despotes, and they pray to him. And they say, God, it doesn't matter what some mortal tells us we can or can't do because we don't answer to them. We answer to you. And they're going to have to answer to you. And that is what they pray. He's the despot. Why does he deserve that title? Because he created everything. They say, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, he made it all. He spoke it all into being. Every atom, every molecule, every cell, every electron spoken into being by our God. Isn't he marvelous? Isn't he majestic? And they pray and they recognize how powerful he is. He commands the elements. We see that all through scripture. As the creator, he has total command. He parts the Red Sea in the book of Exodus. And that is an act of worship by creation to the, its creator. Habakkuk. Uh, remembers that event in, in Habakkuk 3.10. It says, the deep gave forth its voice and lifted its hands on high. What an amazing picture of creation worshiping the creator. He's awesome. And in verse 25, they go on and they say, you know, Sovereign Lord, creator, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant said by the Holy 
spirit. You know what that line right there tells me? That tells me that the early church believed in the doctrine of inspiration. You said through our father David, through the Holy Spirit, and they're about to quote Psalm chapter 2, and they recognize that it ultimately came from God through David. That is what we mean. When we say the Bible is inspired, we're saying that this, this book that we're reading today is not man's book. It's not the imaginings. It's not the scribblings of human minds. It is the very thoughts of God. And he spoke to hand-selected human beings of his own choosing, and they transcribed the mind of God onto paper so that you and I could benefit from it. That is, that is inspiration, and they recognize that, just an observation. And they quote from Psalm 2, and they say, Why do the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? And the kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and his anointed. Why are they quoting this? Why are they quoting the Old Testament? Why Psalm 2? Because Psalm 2 is a prophetic psalm. It's a prophetic psalm. It's speaking of a future event that has yet to happen. It still hasn't happened. This is David's words about a future event called the Battle of Armageddon. One day, all the nations of the earth are going to gather to oppose God and Christ. They're going to come against him. And Psalm 2 says that he laughs at them. And he speaks to them. And he terrifies them by his fury. It's going to happen. And he's going to wipe them off the face of the earth. And they are looking at this last battle before the kingdom age, but they're not thinking of it in the context of a future event. They are reminded of their present circumstance when they look at prophecy and God's control over the here and the now. And in your notes, that is the purpose of prophecy in the Bible. It is to radically affect your present. Why do we study prophecy? Why do we study Daniel and Ezekiel and Isaiah and Revelation, all these weird books with weird symbolism, and it's hard to understand? Because when we do understand it, we have a much better perspective on the present because we know we serve a God who keeps his promises. Amen? Amen. And so they take it to heart. Why do the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? I love those words in vain because that means that no matter what man does to thwart God, it is to no avail. Because in your notes, boy, don't lose sight of this. Our God has no opposition, period. Is that a great truth? It's no contest. He has no competition. And if you, I don't care what you're going through. If you know that and you believe that and you receive that and you know his promises are new every morning, you can rise each day and you can say, whatever comes against me. If God is for me, who can be against me? Amen? So they know this. They understand who they are dealing with. And not only do they understand that, they see the context and they, see, they remember what has just happened a couple months ago. What happened a couple months ago for them? Jesus was crucified. They say in verse 27, For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. See, when, whenever the world comes together, every time the world unites, it's to oppose God. People say, you know, the world needs to come together. We should unite one world. Historically, that only happens when they rebel against God. And it never works out, okay? It didn't work out at the Tower of Babel. It didn't work out when they crucified Jesus. It's not going to work out during the Battle of Armageddon. You know why? Because of what the disciples understood. Next point in your notes, they understood they were part of his plan. Not their plan. Not, not Herod's plan. Not Pilate's plan. Not the Sadducees' plan. We're all a part of his plan. Verse 28 why did Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Jews and the Gentiles, why did they do what they did to crucify Jesus? It tells us that they gathered in verse 28 to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. You think the death of Christ was a surprise to God? No. Everything that Herod did, everything Pilate did, the Jews, whoever hated Jesus' guts, whatever motivation they had to see him dead, they were playing into the hand and the plan of God Almighty, and aren't you glad? 
And the crucifixion of Jesus Christ was predestined. And to say that is to speak to the sovereignty of God. Who did they pray to? They said, Sovereign Lord. God is sovereign. What does that mean? Does that mean that everything that happens is God's will? No, that's not what it means. To say that is to say that, that even when, when people sin, that God wants us to sin. No, obviously God doesn't want us to sin. Sovereignty is not that everything happens as God's will. Sovereignty is that God can use everything that happens, even the actions of evil people, to accomplish his will. I can't fully understand that because I've got three pounds of fallen matter in this skull of mine, same as you. And we're going to have to trust God in the meantime. And one day we will understand in full what we now only understand in part. But God is able to use every evil act to further his sovereign will. And the crucifixion is the prime example of that. They crucified the Lamb of God. It was the most evil event in history. Because he was perfect. He was without sin. And they tortured him. And they put him on a cruel cross. And they put him to death. What was the most gracious, most beneficial, most awesome, grandest event in all of human history? Same event. Why? Because God used it to serve as the atonement for our sin and to bring us into a right relationship with him. It was horrible and awful because of the motivations of man. It was beautiful and majestic because of the motivations of God. That is sovereignty. And they understood that. And they understood that because of this act that took place, God's work in the past assures his power in the present. His work in the past assures his power in the present. Look at verse 29. What are the first two words they say? And now. That's the present. Okay? They marvel at what he did through Pilate and through Herod. And because of that, they say, and now, God Not one day, now. What God did do, Calvary, what God will do, Armageddon, he can and does do now in your life and in my life. And they pray. And as they pray, they understood their primary need. Sometimes I I don't think we always understand our primary need as we pray. I don't always pray for my biggest need. I, you, most of the time I pray for my biggest want, right? How about you? Sometimes I pray for a secondary need, but I don't always understand what it is. God knows what I need. Thank the Lord. They understood their primary need. What would you be tempted to pray if you were them, if you were these believers right here, and somebody had threatened your life, said, if you speak the name of Jesus, you are going to die. How would you pray? I'd be tempted to pray, God, kill him. Just smoke them, God. Just wipe them. I'd go all Old Testament on them. I'd be, God, smite their ruin asunder on the mountainside. Lord, that's not how they pray. Look how they pray. Look at verse 29. They pray, and now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. Man, we don't do that anymore. We don't pray that way. We are not in the business of boldness like they were then. Their prayer is not for God to change their circumstance. Their prayer is for God to change them and help them rise to the level to meet that challenge. They don't pray, God, lead me around the valley of the shadow of death. They say, God, lead us into and through the valley of the shadow of death. Be with us as we go. Make us bold. Help us to not chicken out. Man, we're, why, why, why don't we pray like that? I think we've lost something, the church today. We're more, we're more we get, what do we get fired up about? We don't get fired up about this. We don't get fired up about souls like we ought to about being bold for God. We get fired up about our rights. We get offended when the world slights us. We post things, right? What do we get? If people said, what if Christians get motivated about? The answer might be what we post about, what we talk about. Man, can you believe that store doesn't say Merry Christmas anymore? Can you believe that? Can you believe ABC canceled Last Man Standing? I mean, come on. 
Doesn't Hollywood care about wholesome family entertainment anymore? No. No, they don't. You know why? They need Jesus. That's the bigger need. That ought to fire us up. People need Jesus. Without him, they're going to go to hell. Every day, souls slip into eternity. That ought to fire us up. We need boldness, right? And we are tempted to pray for deliverance. But I want you to see in your notes, when you're tempted to pray for deliverance, remember that deliverance has already come. What we need most now is boldness. That's what we need. The deliverance is already yours. You have been delivered from the consequences and from the power of sin. And it is that deliverance that the world needs. And you have to make that known to them, but you need boldness to do it. We're in a war. We are in a spiritual war, and lives are being lost. Let me take you to a physical war, an historic war. It was 1945. There was a young, skinny guy in Lynchburg, Virginia, which is a town I know well from my college days. A young man by the name of Desmond T. Doss. You may know that name. Maybe you've seen a movie about him recently. Like many guys of his generation, Desmond Doss, because he was patriotic and loved his country, he enlisted in the Army, wanted to serve and and join the war effort. But unlike a lot of his peers, Desmond Doss was a committed Christian. In fact, he was an ardent Seventh-day Adventist. And as such, he interpreted the Ten Commandments in very strict sense, especially the Sixth Commandment, which says, Thou shalt not kill. And because he had a strict interpretation of that, it meant that he could not, would not ever touch a gun because he would never take a life. And yet he enlisted in the army. How does that mindset work? When you, how do you serve your country on the battlefield when you will not touch a gun and you will not take life? And yet Desmond Doss purposed in his heart. His mission was the saving of lives. And so he joined the army to become a medic. That's the most dangerous job the army had to offer, compounded by the fact that he was not going to carry a weapon. Desmond Doss joined the army. He took a lot of mockery. He took a lot of abuse, even at the hands of his own fellow soldiers. They, They mocked him. They sneered at him. They beat him. They spat upon him. They pushed him around. They urged him to quit. They called him a coward. His own commanding officer saw him as a liability because he wouldn't touch a gun and because he requested leave for every Sabbath day. He didn't give up. He was committed to his mission of saving lives. And one day, on the Pacific island of Okinawa, Desmond Doss's outfit was given orders to assault the Maeda Escarpment, a jagged hilltop that had a sheer cliff. And atop that, the Japanese were dug in, and they controlled artillery for miles in many directions. And their outfit was to climb, to scale that jagged cliffside, to come up over the Japanese position. And another company was going to come up the other side, and they were going to rein the Japanese in and take them out. But what they didn't know is the other company had come up, and they'd been shot to pieces. And Doss's company, as they came up over the top of that cliff, they were on their own. And the Japanese were ready for them. And they got pinned down. And guys were dropping left and right. They were falling. And Doss looks around and he sees dying, dying, dead, dead, wounded, dying, dying, bleeding to death. It was a hopeless situation. And the call came, the order came to abort to pull back. Get out of there! Get out of there! And Doss could not abandon his mission. And he would not abandon his men And so he came out amid the whizzing bullets, amid the shell bursts, and he dragged the wounded one by one to a safe spot behind a rock where he tied a double bowline knot around their chest, around their legs, and he lowered them each 35 feet down that cliff. And he went back, charged back into the hellfire of war to retrieve more wounded, and he prayed. And I can hear that Virginia drawl as he prayed, Dear Lord, help me get one more. Help me get one more. He got one more. And another, and another, 
and another and another. And by the end of that day, as they were all back to safety, Doss and his company, the final tally was made. All the men that Private Desmond T. Doss of Lynchburg, Virginia had rescued, 75 soldiers. Now, he didn't pray. God, get me out of here. He didn't pray, God, silence the guns of our enemies. No, he prayed, Lord, help me get one more. Help me get one more. One more. What's your prayer? You're in a war. Souls are slipping into eternity left and right every day. What are you praying? Every morning as you rise, you should seek that the Lord would empower you to save one more, one more, one more. And you should be never satisfied until he takes you home to glory. We must pray for boldness. I am impacted by the fact that Peter and John, in verse 13, the Sadducees see them and they remark that they were bold. They notice that they were bold. And yet here they are. What are they praying for? More boldness. More boldness, ever-increasing boldness. To what end? They had already won thousands to Christ. They just preached on Pentecost. Thousands came to saving faith. They preached at the temple after they healed the beggar. Thousands came to saving faith. It ain't enough. God, make us more bold. Make us more bold. Help us get one more. Just one more. One more. What was God's response to the church's prayer? He made them powerful. In your notes, he made them powerful. He answered their prayer in verse 31. When they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. It was an earthquake. Remember, they were praying to the creator. He commands the elements. They prayed, and creation said, amen. And God answered their prayer, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they continued to speak the word of God with boldness. You're going to be bold. You're going to need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You need the filling of the Holy Spirit. Ask him to fill you each and every day. The rest of this chapter, verse 32 through 37, speaks of the fact that they came together, they loved one another, they met one another's needs, they had all things in common, they shared their goods, they shared their property. This is the testimony of the church throughout history when it has suffered persecution. They have come together. And this is the proof that God was answering their prayer because the love that they have for one another in meeting one another's needs is a part of their testimony. It's a part of their witness. Jesus said, by this, all men will know you are my disciples in that you have love for one another. You gotta have love. See, he, he, he made them powerful, but in your notes, he made them living proof Your supernatural message must be accompanied by a supernatural love. That is the validation for the message that you have. The world will look at your love, and then they will listen to your words. Without love, you're just a clanging symbol. You're just another kiosk in the marketplace of ideas and philosophies. We need love, and we need to pray for each other. And we're going to do that right now. I'm going to invite our mission teams that are going overseas in just a couple of weeks. Come on up here, guys. We've got a team going to Spain, and, we got a, and I'm going to Spain, and we got a team going to Belize, and you guys get to commission us right now. Thank Come on, you. church. Give them a hand right now. Come on, team, all the way up across in the light so we can see you. What a good-looking group of people, matching T-shirts and everything. This is going to be awesome. Our team for Spain is our young adults team. They are leaving the 23rd of June, and then our team going to Belize is leaving on the 24th, and it is awesome. I think this is the first time in the history of our church where we're commissioning two teams on the same weekend, which is just really cool. Impact is our word for the year, and this team is excited about the impact that God's going to have on other parts of the world. Now, our Spain team is going to be doing uh, some line dancing, drawing a crowd, and uh, there's going to be pastors sharing the gospel, and we're hoping that uh, just a lot of people would come to know Christ. In fact, how many of you would love to see a little line dancing right now? Wouldn't that be cool? 
All right, I'm not going to make you do it, but maybe the 1130 service, you never know, all right? So uh, we're going to have a great time uh, over in Spain and just doing a lot of evangelism. And then our team going to Belize. Uh, our team uh, is going to do something really special. We've got a ministry here at Shelter Cove called Sidekicks, and it's where we hang out with uh, kids with special needs. My son is one of those, and we just love on them, take care of them, and check this out. This team going to Belize is going to a, a camp to help out with kids with special needs for one week. And so we just want to thank you for representing Christ. Can we just give them a hand again? Just so, so awesome with what God's doing. So we want to take a moment just to pray over this team. There is so much spiritual attack when you go on the mission field. Uh, so many wrong things can happen when you travel. And uh, we just want to pray that God just prepares their hearts and keeps them unified safe and healthy as they go and represent Christ. So would you just do me a favor and extend a hand as we pray a prayer of blessing and a prayer of commissioning over this team right now. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you so much for all my brothers and sisters up here on stage that are going to represent you. God, for those going to Spain, those going to Belize, God, we pray that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit. God, that you would give them a supernatural boldness that alone comes from you, that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit, that there would be a unity that is obvious in the eyes of others. God, we know that the enemy is, is one that likes to attack and divide. So we pray for your spiritual protection. We pray for health. We pray for safety. God, we pray that because of these teams, people would know about the love of Jesus, see the love of Jesus, and respond to the love of Jesus in a way that transforms their lives. God, we love you, and we trust you, and we ask that you would use these teams in ways that just, just transform people's lives. God, change them as they leave and as they go. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, one more time. Can we appreciate these teams heading out? Keep them in prayer. We are behind you guys. We love you guys. Thank you for representing our church and our Savior so well. Amen. Now, don't go anywhere because we're going to commission you. All right? I want you guys to stand hmm. because you're on the mission field, too. You know, the mission field is not overseas. The mission field is just outside your door, hmm. across the street, around the world. You've all got the same mission, believers. And so we want to take this time in looking at this text today. We think it's important yeah. to commission you as you go out this week. Team, would you extend a hand toward these faithful followers of Jesus? Heavenly Father, we pray for these Christians out here. As they go about their day tomorrow, God, would you fill them, each one, with your Holy Spirit? Would you make them bold as lions? Would you make them powerful and give them your eyes to see every opportunity and to take advantage of it to share the faith and the hope of Jesus Christ with a lost and dying world? And we look forward to celebrating what you are going to do in and through them this week. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hey, if you are a part of our prayer team, we would love for you to come up at this moment. If we can pray for you or encourage you in any way, our prayer team will be up here in the front. Uh, I'll be in the Welcome Center. We'd love to meet you and your family if you're new to Shelter Cove. Don't forget next weekend, Father's Day weekend. It's going to be a blast. Come experience all the fun activities out on the lawn. We'll see you then. Have a great weekend.